freeing of the self. The self, wrapped up in the five vestures, beginning with the vesture formed of food, which are brought into being by its own power, does not shine forth as the water in the pond covered by a veil of green scum. When the green scum is taken away, immediately the water shines forth pure, taking away thirst and heat, straightway becoming a source of great joy to man. When the five vestures have been stripped off, the self shines forth pure, the one essence of eternal bliss beheld within, supreme, self-luminous. Discernment is to be made between the self and what is not self by the wise man seeking freedom from bondage. Through this, he enters into joy, knowing the self which is being, consciousness, bliss. As the reed from the tiger grass, so separating from the contraries of things visible the hidden self within, which is detached, not involved in actions, and dissolving all in the self. He who stands thus has attained liberation. The vesture formed of food. The food formed vesture is this body, which comes into being through food, which lives by food, which perishes without food. It is formed of cuticle, skin, flesh, blood, bone, water. This is not worthy to be the self, eternally pure. The self was before birth or death and now is. How can it be born for the moment, fleeting, unstable of nature, not unified, inert, beheld like a jar? For the self is the witness of all changes of form. The body has hands and feet, not the self, though bodiless yet because it is the life, because it is power, because its power is indestructible. It is controller, not controlled. Since the self is witness of the body, its character, its acts, its states, therefore the self must be of other nature than the body. A mass of wretchedness clad in flesh full of impurity and evil. How can this body be the knower? The self is of other nature. Of this compound of skin, flesh, fat, bone, and water, the man of deluded mind thinks, This is I. But he, who is possessed of judgment, knows that his true self is of other character. Is nature transcendental? The mind of the dullard thinks of the body. This is I. He who is more learned thinks, This is I of the body and the separate self. But he who has attained discernment and is wise knows the true self, saying, I am the eternal. Therefore, O thou of mind deluded, put away the thought that this body is the self this compound of skin, flesh, fat, bone, and water, discern the universal self, the eternal, changeless, and enjoy supreme peace. So long as the man of learning abandons not the thought founded on delusion that this is I, regarding the unenduring body and its powers, so long there is no hope for his liberation, though he possess the knowledge of the Vedanta and its sciences. As thou hast no thought that this is the self, regarding the body's shadow or the reflected form, or the body seen in dream, or the shape imagined in the mind, so let not this thought exist regarding the living body. The thought that the body is the self in the minds of men who discern not the real, is the seed from which spring birth and death and sorrow. Therefore, slay thou this thought with strong effort, 
For when thou hast abandoned this thought, the longing for rebirth will cease. The vesture formed of vital breath. The breath formed vesture is formed by the life breath, determined by the five powers of action. Through its power, the food formed vesture, guided by the self and sustained by food, moves in all bodily acts. Nor is this breath formed vesture the self, since it is formed of the vital airs, coming and going like the wind, moving within and without, since it can in no wise discern between right and wrong, between one self and another, but is ever dependent. The vesture formed of mind. The mind formed vesture is formed of the powers of perception and the mind. It is the cause of the distinction between the notions of mind and I. It is active in making a distinction of names and numbers. Is more potent, it pervades and dominates the former vesture. The fire of the mind formed vesture, fed by the five powers of perception, as though by five sacrificial priests, with objects of sense like streams of melted butter, blazing with the fuel of manifold sense impressions, sets the personality aflame. For there is no unwisdom except in the mind, for the mind is unwisdom, the cause of the bondage to life. When this is destroyed, all is destroyed. When this dominates, the world dominates. In dream, devoid of substance, it emanates a world of experiencer and things experienced, which is all mind. So in waking consciousness there is no difference. It is all the domination of the mind. During the time of dreamlessness, when mind has become latent, nothing at all of manifestation remains. Therefore man's circle of birth and death is built by mind and has no permanent reality. By the wind, a cloud is collected. By the wind that is driven away again. By mind bondage is built up. By mind is built also liberation. Building up desire for the body and all objects, it binds the man thereby as an ox by a cord. Afterwards, leading him to turn from them like poison. That same mind verily sets him free from bondage. Therefore, mind is the cause of man's bondage, and in turn of his liberation. When darkened by the powers of passion, it is the cause of bondage. And when pure of passion and darkness, it is the cause of liberation. Where discernment and dispassion are dominant, gaining purity, the mind makes for liberation. Therefore, let the wise man who seeks liberation strengthen these two in himself as the first step. Mind is the name of the muddy tiger that hunts in the forest glades of sensuous things. Let not the wise go thither who seek liberation. Mind molds all sensuous things through the earthly body and the subtle body of him who experiences. Mind ceaselessly shapes the differences of body, of color, of condition, of race, as fruits caused by the acts of the potencies. Mind beclouding the detached pure consciousness, binding it with the cords of the body, the powers, the life breaths as I and my ceaselessly strays among the fruits of experience caused by its own activities. Man's circle of birth and death comes through the fault of attributing reality to the unreal. But this false attribution is built up by mind. This is the effective cause of birth and death. 
and sorrow for him who has the faults of passion and darkness and is without discernment. Therefore the wise who know the truth have declared that mind is unwisdom, to which the whole world verily is swept about as cloud belts by the wind. Therefore, purification of the mind should be undertaken with strong effort by him who seeks liberation. When the mind has been purified, liberation comes like fruit into his hand. Through the sole power of liberation, uprooting desire for sensuous things and ridding himself of all bondage to works, he, who through faith in the real, stands firm in the teaching, shakes off the very essence of passion from the understanding. The mind-formed vesture cannot be the higher self, since it has beginning and end, waxing and waning. By causing sensuous things, it is the very essence of pain. That which is itself seen cannot be the seer. The vesture formed of intelligence. The intelligence, together with the powers of intelligence, makes the intelligence formed vesture, whose distinguishing character is actorship. It is the cause of man's circle of birth and death. The power which is a reflected beam of pure consciousness called the understanding is a mode of abstract nature. It possesses wisdom and creative power. It thereby focuses the idea of I in the body and its powers. This I, beginningless in time, is the separate self. It is the initiator of all undertakings. This, impelled by previous imprints, works all works both holy and unholy and forms their fruits. Passing through varying births, it gains experience, now descending, now ascending. Of this intelligence formed vesture, waking, dream, and dreamlessness, are the fields where it experiences pleasure and pain. By constantly attributing to itself the body, state, condition, duties, and works, thinking, these are mine. This intelligence form vesture, brightly shining because it stands closest to the higher self, becomes the vesture of the self, and thinking itself to be the self wanders in the circle of birth and death. This formed of intelligence is the light that shines in the vital breast in the heart. The self who stands forever wears this vesture as actor and experiencer. The self assuming the limitation of the intelligence, self deluded by the air of the intelligence, Though it is the universal self, yet views itself as separate from the self, as the potter views the jars as separate from the clay. Through the force of its union with the vesture, the higher self takes on the character of the vesture and assumes its nature. As fire, which is without form, takes on the varying forms of the iron even though the self is forever by nature uniform and supreme. The disciple speaks. Whether by delusion or otherwise, the higher self appears as the separate self. But since the vesture is beginningless, there is no conceivable end of the beginningless. Therefore, existence as the separate self must be eternal. Nor can the circle of birth and death have an end. How can there be liberation? Master, tell me this. The master answers. Well, hast thou asked, O wise one? Therefore rightly hear. A false imagination created by air is not conclusive proof. Only through delusion can there be an association with objects, of that which is without attachment, without action, without form. It is like the association of blueness with the sky. The appearance as the separate self of the self, the seer, 
who is without qualities, without form, essential wisdom and bliss, arises through the delusion of the understanding. It is not real. When the delusion passes, it exists no longer, having no substantial reality. Its existence, which is brought into being through false perception because of delusion, lasts only so long as the air lasts, as the serpent and the rope endures only as long as the delusion. When the delusion ceases, there is no serpent. The Witness the manifest and the hidden self. Beginningless is unwisdom, and all its works are too. But when wisdom is arisen, what belongs to unwisdom, although beginningless, like a dream on waking, perishes root and all, though beginningless, it is not endless. It is as something that was not before and now is. This is manifest. It is thus seen, though without a beginning, on wisdom comes to an end, just as something which before was not comes into being. Built up in the self by its being bound by disguise of intellect. In this existence as the separate life, for there is no other than the self distinguished by its own nature, but the binding of the self by the intellect is false, coming from unknowledge. This binding is untied by perfect knowledge, not otherwise. The discerning of the oneness of the eternal and the self is held by the scripture to be perfect knowledge. This binding is untied by perfect knowledge, not otherwise. The discerning of the oneness of the eternal and the self is held by the scripture to be perfect knowledge and this is accomplished by perfectly discerning between self and not self. Therefore, discernment is to be gained between individual and universal self. Water may be endlessly muddy, but when the mud is gone, the water is clear. As it shines, so shines the self also. When faults are gone away, it shines forth clear. And when unreality ceases to exist in the individual self, it is clear that it returns towards the universal. Hence, there is to be a rejection of the self-assertion and other characteristics of the individual self. Hence, this higher self is not what is called the intellectual veil, because that is changeful, helpless of itself, circumscribed, objective, liable to err. The non-eternal cannot be regarded as eternal. The bliss-formed veil is a form containing the reflection of bliss. Although it is tainted with darkness, it has the quality of pleasure. The attainment of well-wished-for aims. It shines forth in the enjoyment of good works by a righteous man, of its own nature bliss-formed, gaining an excellent form. He enjoys bliss without effort. The principal sphere of the bliss-formed veil is in dreamless sleep. In dreaming and waking, it is in part manifest when blissful objects are beheld. Nor is this bliss-formed veil the higher self, for it wears a disguise. It is a form of objective nature. It is an effect caused by good acts accumulated in this changeful form. When the five veils are taken away, according to inference and scripture, what remains after they are taken away is the witness, in a form born of awakening. This is the self, self-shining, distinguished from the five veils. This is the witness and the three modes of perceiving without change, without stain. The wise should know it as being and bliss, as his own self. The people said, When the five veils are thus set aside through their unreality, beyond the non-being of all, I see nothing, Master. 
What then is to be known as anything by him who knows self and not self? The master said, Truth has been spoken by thee, wise one. Thou art skilled in judgment. Self-assertion and all these changes. In the self they have no being. That whereby all is enjoyed, but which is itself not enjoyed. Know that to be the self, the knower, through thy very subtle intellect. Whatever is enjoyed by anyone, of that he is the witness. But of that which is not enjoyed by anyone, it cannot be said that anyone is the witness. That is to be self-witness where anything is enjoyed by itself. Therefore the universal self is witness of itself. No lesser thing is witness of it. In waking, dreaming, dreamlessness, that self is clearly manifested, appearing through its universal form always as I, as the I within uniformly. This is I beholding intellect and the rest that partake of varied forms and changes. It is manifest through eternal blissful self-consciousness. Know that is the self here in the heart. Looking at the reflection of the sun reflected in the water of a jar, he who is deluded thinks it is the sun. Thus the reflected consciousness appearing under a disguise is thought by him who is hopelessly deluded to be I. Rejecting jar and water and the sun reflected there, all together, the real sun is beheld. So the unchanging one which is reflected in the three modes self-shining is perceived by the wise. Putting away in thought, body, and intellect is alike reflections of consciousness discerning the seer, hid in the secret place, the self, the partless awakening, the universal shining, distinguished alike from what exists and what does not exist, the eternal Lord, all present, very subtle, devoid of within and without, nothing but self, discerning this perfectly, in its own form. A man is sinless, passionless, deathless, sorrowless, altogether bliss, full of wisdom, fearing nothing at all from anything. There is no other path of freedom from the bondage of the world but knowledge of the reality of his self, for him who would be free. Knowledge that the eternal is not divided from him is the cause of freedom from the world, whereby the eternal, the second less bliss, is gained by the awakened. Therefore one should perfectly know that the eternal and the self are not divided, for the wise who has become the eternal does not return again to birth and death. The real, wisdom, the endless, the eternal, pure, supreme, self-perfect, the one essence of eternal bliss, universal, undivided, unbroken, this he gains. This is the real, supreme, secondless, for besides the self, no other is. There is nothing else at all in the condition of perfect awakening to the reality of the Supreme Being. This is all, this all, that is perceived by the very form world, from on knowledge. This all is the eternal, when the mind's confusion is cast away. The pot made of clay is not separate from the clay, for all through it is in its own nature clay. The form of the pot is not separate. Whence then the pot? It is a mere name, built up of illusion. By no one can the form of the pot be seen separate from the clay. Hence the pot is built of delusion. But the real thing is the clay, like the Supreme Being. All this is always an effect of the real eternal. It is that alone, nor is there anything else but that. He who says there is is not free from delusion, 
like one who talks in his sleep. The eternal verily is this all. Thus says the excellent scripture of the Atharva. In accordance with it, all this is the eternal only. Nor is there any separate existence of the attribute apart from the source. If this moving world were the real, then had the self no freedom from limitation, divine authority no worth, the master self no truth. These three things the great sold cannot allow. The master who knows the reality of things declared, I verily am not contained in these things, nor do these creatures stand for me. If the world be real, then it should be apprehended in dreamless sleep. It is not apprehended there, therefore it is unreal, dreamlike, false. Therefore the world is not separate from the higher self. What is perceived as separate is false. The natural potencies and the like. What real existence is there in the attribute? Its support shines forth as with attributes elusively. Whatever is delusively perceived by one deluded is the eternal. The silver shining is only the pearl shell. The eternal is perpetually conceived as formed. But what is attributed to the eternal is a name only. Therefore the supreme eternal being is being, secondless, of the form of pure knowledge, stainless, peaceful, free from beginning or ending, changeless. Its own nature is unbroken bliss. Every difference made by world glamour set aside, eternal, lasting, partless, measureless, formless, unmanifest, nameless, unfading, a self-shining light that illuminates all that is. With a difference of knower, knowing, known is gone, endless, sure, absolute, partless, pure consciousness, the wise know this is the supreme reality. That can neither be left nor taken, is no object of mind or speech. Immeasurable, beginningless, endless, the perfect eternal, the universal I. That thou art, the eternal and the self, indicated by the two words that. And thou, when clearly understood, according to the scripture, that thou art, are one, their oneness is again ascertained. This identity of theirs is in their essential, not their verbal meanings, for they are apparently of contradictory character, like the firefly and the sun, the sovereign and the surf, the well and the great waters, the atom and Mount Meru. The contradiction between them is built up by their disguises, but this disguise is no real thing at all. The disguise of the master self is the world glamour, the cause of the celestial and other worlds. The disguise of the individual life is the group of five veils. Here, this, now. These are the two disguises of the supreme and the individual life. When they are set aside together, there is no longer the supreme nor the individual life. The king has his kingdom, the warrior his weapons. When these two are put away, there is neither warrior nor king. According to the scripture saying, this is the instruction, the self is not that, not that. The twofoldness that was built up sinks away of itself in the eternal. Let the truth of this scripture be grasped through awakening. The putting away of the two disguises must verily be accomplished. It is not this, it is not this, because this is built up. It is not the real. 
like the serpent seen in the rope, or like a dream, thus putting away every visible thing by wise meditation, the oneness of the two, self and eternal, is then to be known. Therefore the two are to be well observed in their essential unity. Neither their contradictory character nor their non-contradictory character is all. But the real and essential being is to be reached in order to gain the essence in which they are one and undivided. When one says, this man is Devadatta, the oneness is here stated by rejecting contradictory qualities. With the great word that thou art, it is the same. What is contradictory between the two is set aside. As being essentially pure consciousness, the oneness between the real and the self is known by the awakened. And by hundreds of great texts, the oneness, the absence of separateness between the eternal and the self is declared. That is not the physical. It is perfect. After the unreal is put aside, like ether, not to be handled by thought. Hence this matter that is perceived is elusive. Therefore set it aside. Put what is grasped by its own selfhood, that I am the eternal. Know that with the intelligence purified, know the self as partless awakening. Every pot and vessel has always clay as its cause and its material is clay. Just like this. This world is engendered by the real and has the real as itself. The real is its material altogether. That real then which there is none higher. That thou art. The restful. The stainless. Secondless. Eternal. The supreme. The manifest and the hidden self. As dream-built lands and times, objects and knowers of them are all unreal. Just so, here in waking is this world. Its cause is ignorance of the self. Inasmuch as all this world, body and organs, vital breath and personality are all unreal, in so much thou art that, the restful, the stainless, secondless, eternal, the supreme. Far away from birth and conduct, family and tribe, quite free from name and form and quality and fault, beyond space and time and objects, this is the eternal, that thou art. Become it in the self. The supreme that no word can reach, but that is reached by the eye of awakening, pure of stain, the pure reality of consciousness and mind together. This is the eternal, that thou art, become it in the self. Untouched by the six infirmities reached in the heart of those that seek for union, Reach not by the organs, whose being neither intellect nor reason knows. This is the eternal, that thou art. Become it in the self. Built of air is the world. In that it rests, that rests in itself. Different from the existent and the non-existent. Partless, nor bound by causality, is the eternal. That thou art, become it in the self. Birth and growth, decline and loss, sickness and death it is free from, and unfading. The cause of emanation, preservation, destruction is the eternal. That thou art, become it in the self. Where all difference is cast aside, all distinction is cast away, a waveless ocean motionless, ever free with undivided form. This is the eternal, that thou art, become it in the self.
being one, though cause of many, the cause of others, with no cause itself, where cause and caused are merged in one, self being the eternal that thou art, become it in the self. Free from doubt and change, great, unchanging, where changing and unchanging are merged in one supreme, eternal, unfading, joy, unstained, this is the eternal, that thou art, become it in the self. This shines forth manifold to air, to being the self under name and form and quality and change, like gold itself, unchanging ever. This is the eternal, that thou art, become it in the self. This shines out unchanging, Higher than the highest, the hidden one essence, whose character is selfhood, reality, consciousness, joy, endless, unfading. This is the eternal, that thou art, become it in the self. Let a man make it his own, in the self, like a word that is spoken by reasoning from the known by thought. This is as devoid of doubt as water in the hand. So certain will its reality become. Recognizing this perfectly illumined one, whose reality is altogether pure, as one recognizes the leader of men and the assembled army, and resting on that always, standing firm in one's own self, sank all this world that is born into the eternal. In the soul, in the hidden place, marked neither as what is nor what is not, is the eternal, true, supreme, secondless. He who through the self dwells here in the secret place, for him there is no coming forth again to the world of form. When the thing is well known even, this beginningless mode of thought, I am the doer and the enjoyer, is very powerful. This mode of mind lasting strongly is the cause of birth and rebirth. A looking backward toward the self as dwelling on it is to be effortfully gained. Freedom here on earth, say the saints, is the thinning away of that mode of thought. That thought of I and mine in the flesh, the I and the rest, that are not the self, this transference from the real to the unreal is to be cast away by the wise man by steadfastness in his own self. Finding the Real Self Bondage Through Imagination Recognizing as thine own the hidden self, the witness of the soul in its activities, perceiving truly that am I, destroy the thought of self and all not self. Give up following after the world. Give up following after the body. Give up following after the ritual law. Make an end of transferring selfhood to these. Through a man's imagination being full of the world, through his imagination being full of the ritual law, through his imagination being full of the body, wisdom, truly, is not born in him. For him who seeks freedom from the grasping hand of birth and death, an iron fetter binding his feet, say they who know it, is this potent triad of imaginings. He who has got free from this enters into freedom. The scent of sandalwood that drives all evil odors away comes forth through stirring it with water and the like. All other odors are driven altogether away. The image of the Supreme Self, stained by the dust of imaginings, dwelling inwardly endless evil, comes forth pure by the stirring power of enlightenment as the scent of the sandalwood comes forth clear. In the net of imaginings of things not self, the image of the self is held back by resting on the eternal self, 
their destruction comes, and the self shines clear. As the mind rests more and more on the self behind it, it is more and more freed from outward imaginings. When imaginings are put away and no residue left, he enters and becomes the self, pure of all bonds. Selfhood transferred to things not self. By resting ever in the self, the restless mind of him who seeks union is stilled, and all imaginings fade away. Therefore make an end of transferring selfhood to things not self. Darkness is put away through force and substantial being. Force through substantial being. In the pure, substantial being is not put away. Therefore relying on substantial being, Make an end of transferring selfhood to things not self. The body of desire is nourished by all new works begun. Steadily thinking on this and effortfully holding desires firm, make an end of transferring selfhood to things not self. Thinking, I am not this separate life but the supreme eternal. Beginning by rejecting all but this, make an end of transferring selfhood to things not self. It comes from the swift impetus of imaginings. Understanding the all-selfhood of the self by learning, seeking union, entering the self, make an end of transferring selfhood to things not self. It comes from the self's reflected light in other things. Neither in taking nor giving does the sage act at all. Therefore, by ever resting on the one, make an end of transferring selfhood to things not self. Through sentences like, That thou art, awakening to the oneness of the eternal and the self, to confirm the self and the eternal, make an end of transferring selfhood to things not self. While there yet lingers a residue undissolved of the thought that this body is the self, carefully seeking union with the self, make an end of transferring selfhood to things not self. As long as the thought of separate life and the world shines, dreamlike even, so long incessantly, O oh wise one, make an end of transferring selfhood to things not self. The body of desire, born of father and mother of impure elements, made up of fleshly things impure, is to be abandoned as one abandons an impure man afar. Gain thy end by becoming the eternal. The real in things unreal. As the space in a jar in universal space, so the self is to be merged without division in the self supreme. Rest thou ever thus, O sage. Through the separate self gaining the self, self shining as a resting place, let all outward things from a world system to a lump of clay be abandoned like a vessel of impure water. Raising the thought of I from the body to the self, that is consciousness being bliss, and lodging it there, leave form and become pure forever. Knowing that I am that eternal, wherein this world is reflected like a city in a mirror, thou shalt perfectly gain thy end. What is of real nature, self-formed, original consciousness, secondless bliss, formless, actless, entering that, let a man put off this false body of desires, worn by the self as a player puts on a costume. For the self, all that is seen is but a mirage. It lasts but for a moment. We see and know it is not I. How could I know all be said of the personal self that changes every moment? The real I is witness of the personal self and its powers, 
as its being is perceived always, even in dreamless sleep. The scripture says the self is unborn, everlasting. This is the hidden self, distinguished neither as what exists, nor what has no existence. The beholder of every change in things that change can be the unchanging alone. In the mind's desires, in dreams, in dreamless sleep, the insubstantial nature of things that change is clearly perceived again and again. Therefore, put away the false selfhood of this fleshly body. For the false selfhood of the body is built up by thought. Knowing the self as thine own, unhurt by the three times undivided illumination, enter into peace. Put away the false selfhood of family and race and name, of form and rank. For these dwell in this body. Put away the actorhood and other powers of the body form. Become the self whose self is partless joy. Other bonds of man are seen, causes of birth and death, but the root and first form of them is selfishness.